Welcome to Assistive Technology and the IEP. My name is Jeanette Van Houten, and I'm from Assistive Technology Consulting in New Jersey. What we're going to talk today about is how assistive technology can be written into the student IEP and how to talk to your district about getting assistive technology in the IEP. Our learning objectives today, you'll learn the definition of assistive technology, discuss assistive technology with your school district, understand the difference between assistive technology, alternative augmentative communication, educational technology, and universal design for learning. Identify where on the AT continuum that the AT tools are, and understand the categories that AT is broken down into. So we're going to start with the definition of assistive technology. At its core, assistive technology is any piece of equipment, software, apps, products that maintain, improve, increase an individual's independence in doing a task. So when you listen to any item, it doesn't have to be high tech tools. It could be a straw. It could be a bent spoon. It could be a pencil with a pencil grip. It could be a post-it note. So assistive technology has this wide spectrum of how it's used. In I IDA, right? IDA says that every time you have an IEP meeting about your student, right? That assistive technology needs to be considered. Now the language is kind of vague in what considered is, but the best way to describe it is that it's a consideration, not an obligation. And what that means is that you need to have a conversation with your school district and it needs to be very concise on kind of what you're looking for. And they're not obligated to recommend that tool, right? It means that you have to go through this process and determine what is the possibilities for my child or for this student. Consideration is definitely a conversation. AT is not a doctor's note unless it's a wheelchair, hearing aids, and a communication device. Sometimes, depending on your insurance, they'll require a doctor's note. But bringing a doctor's note to your child's study team means absolutely nothing. It's kind of like bringing your child's IEP to the doctor's office and saying to the doctor, oh, when you're working with my child, you need to do this, right? Because a doctor can't prescribe educational tools. So AT has an expert model and a school-based model. In New Jersey, we mainly have an expert model. Most school districts don't have an AT team. There are a few throughout the state, but mainly we work on an expert model. Some states have a school-based model, it means that they have a team within, within their unit or within the district, and they perform all the AT evals. And others, like some states have a combination that they go, they have it, their AT team, but they have outside consultants because there's too much of a need and the staff can't do everything. AT is not requesting a specific tool. Now there's times that as a parent, you are using a tool at home and you think it could benefit your child using it in school. And you want to bring that to the table to the district. Now, when you're asking the district about, could this tool be used? Most of the time, the district will look at it and say, hey, that's probably a great tool, let's try it. Or they'll be like, ah, you know, we have something similar, won't we try that, right? But it's all about that conversation. If you open up the conversation about all the possibilities, the strategies and tools that are possible, um, you start really building that AT toolkit. You start building all the possibilities for your child and having the team and because the parent is part of the team help develop that knowledge and skill set and have everybody understand where it is that you're trying to go with your child okay so we're going to talk about the different models as i said in the previous one there's the expert model and the school-based model we're going to first start with the school model when it comes to the school model it's the iep team will probably use a product called the set. It's by Joy Zabala. And I even use it as an expert model. I have teams work through with this with me because it stands for the student, the environment, the tasks and the tools, right? I, as an expert model, right? Coming in, not knowing your child, never working with your child. I need to know about that student as much as possible. I need to know their likes, their dislikes, 
their favorite part of the day, things they sounds they don't like, um, how often they need a break, right? So when we talk about the student, even in the school model, we're talking about, tell me everything about this individual. Then we look at the environment. The environment plays a huge part in how a student can learn, right? When you look at the environment, does the student perform better in one environment over another environment? So we look at what is the teacher doing that's different in one environment and over to the second environment. I can walk into a classroom and the one classroom can be very sparse. There's just a few things on the wall and it's very direct to what the students are learning at that moment. Or I can walk into a classroom and it looks like the teacher has spent her year salary on everything that's been designed for teachers and displays. So if we look at those two different environments, the student may perform better in the environment that has less material on the wall because they're, they know exactly where they need to look and where to get information versus the other classroom, which is everything is on the wall and I have no idea where I'm supposed to be looking. The most important part of the set is to talk about the tasks. And this is where you have to break down the tasks. If you say a student is struggling, if your child is struggling with writing, well, what part of writing? Is it the mechanics of writing? Is it the composition of writing? Is it getting ideas from their head to the paper? Is it spelling? Like they really struggle when writing, they really struggle with the task of writing. But you have to really kind of hone down on what the task is. And tools is always last. And the reason it's last is because it's the last thing we should be talking about. The tools don't matter until we get the first part of set taken care of. When it comes to the tools and we say, okay, we've got a great picture of the student. We know what the environments look like. We know the tasks they have to do. Okay, let's brainstorm tools. And when we look at the tools, everything goes on. Everything goes onto this list. Everybody has an idea, you write it down. And then we start prioritizing what tools make sense for this specific student and for the task that we're looking at. Then on the next part of the model, right, is determining that it's going to be an in-house consultation and who's going to be responsible for the in-house consultation, the trials and the deadlines. This is extremely important, especially when using a school model because you wanna know that it's being done in a timely manner, that we're gonna start immediately understanding what tools are needed, who's gonna install them, who's gonna double check, and what our deadlines are for these trials. It's gonna take a week, two weeks, three weeks to go through this trial. If we're doing a communication eval, it should take four weeks for the trial to take part. The student should be in front of that device or devices for each device four weeks, because that's how long it takes to start implementing it. Then when you use an in-house school team, they really work with the IT team on installation of these tools that are being suggested. Then when it comes to outcomes, outcomes are really interesting because most times school districts will, or teams will look at, well, what does it say in the student's IEP? That's too broad of an objective for outcomes in trials. When you look at a trial, you're looking at a small window of time. So it's a short, short benchmark and it's part of the bigger picture. So if we're going to go back to writing, right? And we know the student struggles with spelling. We know the student struggles with um, written expression. Like they may maybe get two words down on the paper within five, 10 minutes. So our objectives for that specific trial might be that the student will have 50% less errors using a spell check. Clicker eight, the student will write two complete sentences independently using a model. You can collect your data very specifically on any given day or any given task actually, because writing happens across all domains of school, right? What did they decrease? Oh, look at that. Uh, we look at the data and they go, hey, look, he's decreased his spelling errors. He's increased his ability to spell and checking his work independently. 
hey, look at that. He wrote three sentences. We started off with one full sentence. And by the time we were done with our trial, he was at three sentences. Yes, this tool is working. So the difference between a school model and an expert model is when it comes to one of the big things is the reports, right? Typically when you have a school-based model, it's data listed on the trials, like when the trial was started, the outcomes, and then if the trial should continue or discontinue, right? And then on the last sheet is typically the recommendations that after doing these trials, this is what we're recommending. So when we get to the expert model, the team has decided that they need to go to an outside person because they don't have the skill set to do the evaluation that's needed, or they don't have the staff to do it. So the district either has a person on consulting, like they're on a retainer and this is like, this person does all the AT evals, or they have a list of providers that they pick and choose who's gonna do the services for the district based on that person's expertise, right? So I am an AT consultant. My background is a special education teacher. I will not do an AAC eval. I'm not a speech therapist. I can support an individual with a communication device, but I can't do an AT eval. First off, insurance wouldn't accept my, my eval because I'm not a speech therapist, but I also don't have the expertise as of a speech language pathologist. So then once the team selects the AT consultant to do the evaluation, the case manager has to go up to the director of special services, get the approval. The consultant paperwork is filled out. Typically it'll go to the case manager, the parents, and all the teachers and all the supporting staff. Once the consultant has all that information, dates are given to the school district. So using an expert model could take longer than using a school base because you have to coordinate all this stuff and get paperwork sent back and forth. The consultant, once they have all the paperwork they need, they'll review the IEP, talk to the educational staff, talk to the parents in detail, and then work with the student one-on-one. -on -one. The difference between the expert model and the school model is that typically for an expert model, I'll sit down with the student one to two, one to three times, depending on the individual, and we'll work on, we could work for like an hour and a half, two hours each clip. I have a tendency to lean towards, I don't want to take that student out of a class for more than one period. And that's why I might, I might do more sessions with a student and fatigue levels and stuff like that. So once the evaluation is completed, roughly two to three weeks after the eval is completed, the school district receives a, a report. The difference between the expert model and the school model is that the expert will send a full report. It'll talk about everything that they did during the evaluation, the outcomes, the student's typing rate. Did they type better on a computer versus an iPad? Was their handwriting faster than typing? They'll also look at what type of reading tools that student may need it, depending on the goal that we set for the evaluation. So we're gonna talk about assistive technology and what it really means. The benefits of assistive technology is the enhanced communication, increase independence, and broaden life opportunities. A lot of individuals that need communication, oftentimes they're, they'll use picture exchange, they'll use um, PCS symbols, they'll use static communication boards, they may have an iPad, right? but it's not being implemented or it's not robust enough for the student to communicate everything. Increase independence. When we look at independence, what is this individual able to do by themselves without having an adult touch them? Like they're not prompting them in any way that the student can just walk over and start typing. Or the student can go over and pick up a crayon and start coloring like everyone else. What does that look for by each individual? So we're looking at increased participation, promotes development, enhances learning, and boosts self-esteem. So when we look at increased participation, is the student attending, we'll do morning circle, right? If the student never stays in their seat for 
morning circle. How can we get them to come to morning circle and spend more time? What are the th strategies that we need to do to increase that participation? How do we promote development of seat readiness or visual attention? But we really need to understand that individual student to understand why circle time is so tough for them to sit at, or what are the skills we're really focusing on for that student to develop. I'm going to show a video here. This is a young boy that has visual impairments who is using a braille writer to write his name. Hi, my name is Mason. Mason is six years old. Uh, he enjoys a variety of things. He likes music. This instrument is called a ukulele. Uh, he also enjoys playing the Wii. Uh, he loves bowling and tennis, and he also loves uh, dance party, he calls it, just dance. Uh, it's hard for him to follow along with uh, movements, but he just dances and has a good time. That, that, that's about my favorite game. Mason is visually impaired. Uh, he actually is blind in his left eye, and in his right eye he has partial retina that he uses to see with. With that retina that he has intact, he can see about 2300 vision uh, compared to the normal 2020. We are a normal family and Mason is a normal child and we just use some adaptations to help make him successful and adapt to his needs and the loss of his vision. My name is Abby Pembroke and I'm Mason's teacher of the blind and visually impaired and also his orientation and mobility specialist. In the classroom, Mason uses his mouth baton um, as far as technology goes, mostly for writing activities. So anytime the teacher has the students doing pencil paper writing, Mason uses his mouth baton. You go one, two, three, four, five, six. You just press down these keys. When you type something, it will tell you what you typed. It's like bumps, like bumps to read. There are prerequisite skills that an individual must have before using AT, including understanding cause and effect. There's a lot of controversy about this that a student needs to know cause and effect. And cause and effect is one of those things that come really early in life right? And almost everybody has it. So if a baby is crying and mommy comes up, that's cause and effect. I cry, mommy comes. We've all had the toddler or the infant that takes the toy in their hand, they've got their toy and they drop it on the ground, right? And you pick it up and they do it again. That's cause and effect. Cause and effect is even, even simpler is that as soon as the lights are turned on, if the individual has vision, they'll look towards where the light is. That's cause and effect. So the answer is no, we don't need to have prerequisites. They don't need to have cause and effect. It's automatic. Here's another true and false. Assistive technology can hinder acquisition of skills and development. Now, research tells us that any amount of time that we introduce assistive technology can make a huge difference in a student or an individual's life. Even think of your own life. If you wanted to cook something, right? And say you wanted to cook a hamburger, you're not gonna pick the largest pan you have, you're gonna pick the smallest pan. Or we probably all have a closet full of those gadgets that are gonna make our lives so much easier we find the one tool that we love and that's the one we use. So right now, for example, I love my pressure cooker. I can have dinner ready in four minutes, right? So that has made a huge difference in my life. My assistive technology is my pressure cooker. Now, when we look at data, AT can show a great improvement in students' social, emotional, and academic skills. Now, when we look at the social, emotional, if you're an individual that's constantly struggling with academics and being on time, organizing your materials, right? Oftentimes there's a lot of jokes. Oh, you know, you have the black hole bag. I know you're really trying hard, but you keep spelling that word wrong, right? 
those little things that we say that don't, they seem lighthearted and joking, but for an individual with a learning disability or a disability, those start chipping down at their social emotional. When they have these tools, all of a sudden they've realized they can do things. They have greater independence. No longer are they misorganized or losing things on a regular basis. Their spelling is much better. Doesn't mean that they're not going to select the wrong word to put in to their sentences. It just means that they've spelled it correctly this time. So assistive technology covers a large area of skills, right? A lot of times we talk about reading for assistive technology for a student that struggles with reading, that the computer may be able to read to them, or you can use the built-in supports on a Kindle to have something read. You can go to YouTube and watch a video. Study skills, how to track your assignments, how to break them down into smaller units, right? Writing, we hear a lot about writing, like you can use word prediction, you can have spell check, you can have word completion, you can have use your voice to write. So we hear a lot about the note-taking. How do you improve a student's ability to take notes? What does that look like? Organizational skills. A lot of times individuals have that executive functioning where they struggle with organization. And how does assistive technology look for that? Time management. I'm one of those individuals, if I'm 10 minutes early, I'm 10 minutes late just because I need that time to organize myself for the next appointment, right? Some people, if they're 10 minutes late, they're on time. So hearing for individuals with hearing loss or auditory processing, vision, people with visual impairment or blindness, communication, these are the big areas, but you also have areas of recreation and leisure that are covered by assistive technology. How to access my environment. If I have no ability to reach for a light switch. How do I turn on the lights when I come in the house? If I don't have the ability to open a door, how can I have the door open for me? So these are all things that are assistive technology. A lot of times when we look at assistive technology, assistive technology is an umbrella, umbrella term, right? Kind of covers everything, right? And everything becomes a subset. But what sometimes happens is that when you're talking to your team about assistive technology and you're trying to express that you want to help your child improve their communication and share knowledge and stuff like that, sometimes it gets miscommunicated. So they'll ask for an assistive technology eval. But then when you start talking to the teacher and the case manager and the parent, you realize that really what they're looking for is an augmentative alternative communication eval. AT covers mainly the academics, the executive functioning, activities, daily living, recreation, right? AAC is about improving communication, verbal communication. How do we get our individual to be able to share what they're trying to express to us? And is one mode better than another, right? So when we look at it, um, AAC devices, right? And we look at language. I'm a strong believer that you use multiple ways of communicating. I have a tendency to talk a lot with my hands. My hands are constantly moving, right? I write things down. I might use my voice. I might use body language. I might use facial expressions. Like, what are you talking about? Right? A lot of times when we look at AAC, everybody's looking at one single tool. When an AAC specialist comes in to do the evaluation, they look at the whole picture. What are all the ways an individual is trying to communicate? And one method doesn't override another, right? So if you have an individual that is using a communication device and they ask for, I want a drink, right? Or they say drink. Now you may want to go back and model, I want a drink, but the student shouldn't, shouldn't then be required to verbalize, I want a drink. They've already told you. So it's about practicing modeling and making sure that everybody's on the same page. So when we look at the AAC piece, it's about communicating exactly what you're trying to accomplish with your child. I want my child to be able to express their needs. I want my child to be able to have a conversation with me, right? When it comes to assistive technology, 
be specific. I want my child to be able to listen to a story and answer some questions. I want my child to be able to identify words like in the story and use them in a sentence. For math, same thing. Like I want my child to be able to identify the numbers one through 10. We've been working on it for three years. And you have to be very cautious is if, if you've been working on it for three years, how do we know that they don't know it? Really question that if they've been working on something for a long period of time, just because they're not consistent in identifying everything, it could be that they're tired of keep showing you that they know it. So maybe move on, add another couple of numbers. They might surprise you that when you add the new numbers, they've gotten it right. So assistive technology works on a continuum, right? There's no tech, low tech, mid tech, and high tech. And what the AT continuum means is that when you start building your AT toolkit, no tech, low tech, mid tech, and high tech should all be included in that toolkit. Because there's times that you don't need high tech tools to get an answer. If the student is filling in a worksheet, say the teacher has a worksheet that everybody is working on and it's not an electronic format, how do we help that student create those answers? Well, could we create stickers? Could we maybe use color coding for the words that they just color code the answers where the lines should be? Could we use a stamp? Could we draw lines? Those are strategies that we can use for a fast solution. And sometimes it's what the student wants because sometimes you get a pushback on the high tech stuff. The students don't want to be constantly on the computer. They want to do some pen and paper. They want to practice those skills. So we have to look at what what tool is needed to meet that student's individual need. So the assistive technology continuum can be simple modifications. It could be a pencil holder. It could be a slant board. It could be a static communication board. These are all acceptable, simple modifications that could make a difference in a student's ability to perform a task. Do they always work? No. That's why you have a toolkit. You just keep moving to the next thing until you find what is working for that student for that task. Some more low tech things are a writing grid, right? So this, this is typically used for someone that's visually impaired. I will sometimes photocopy this and it gives very clear dark lines of where the student needs to write. So they only write on so I'll, I'll actually photocopy this on different color paper. I'll do pink, blue, yellow, purple. And the student has to write in the color line and not on the black line. It gives them a distinct place to write. The next picture, right? This is a storybook and the popsicles are numbered and you can say turn to page six and they can take the popsicle and turn to page six. And the next one here, this is a low tech idea, right? This is an, a vibrating alert. So either it's for saying it's time to go to the next task or a reminder to go to the bathroom, or it could be a reminder that you're going to therapy. It's a low tech thing that you set up each day with their schedule. Then we look at the mid tech stuff, right? These are typically things that need some form of battery or being charged. So the visual timer, the visual timer is great for, it's a universal design for learning, right? Everybody benefits from having a timer. Say this meeting is going to last for 30 minutes. You set the timer and as it goes down, okay, at 30 minutes, the task is over. Then for someone that has a visual impairment, they may use an electronic magnifier. So this is a, a digital magnifier that allows the individual to hone into specific words on a page without enlarging every single document, like taking it to photocopier and zooming it up to 400%. And then you have a, a mid tech communication device. This is static, but it has multiple levels and it has the one line that pretty much stays the same for that student. Then when we look at the high end stuff, these are definitely things that need to be plugged in to use, require batteries and that are computer based. So a CCTV is for someone that's visually impaired. 
so that they can see a full document, a communication device that may use eye gaze. Um, the individual is also in a power chair and then an iPad. Those are high end tools. And again, the reason we look at DAT continuum is because when we get up to the high end stuff, if these tools fail, if the battery goes dead, if the computer dies, if the power is out, the individual doesn't have access to that tool. So if you start building your toolkit, then you have access to different ways to communicate while your device is being repaired or charged or the power comes back on. There's other ways to enlarge your document so that you can continue reading. And with eye gaze systems, I always suggest a backup system because with eye gaze, it doesn't work outside. So what we're saying when an individual uses a communication device with eye gaze is that they can only communicate in inside or in the shadow, like in a shaded area, because the eye gaze doesn't work then. So we need a backup system so that they can communicate their needs and wants why their device is not available. So there's many different categories of assistive technology. So we're looking at aids to daily living, right? Mobility and positioning, vision and hearing, computer access. When it comes to aids for daily living, how does this individual brush their teeth? Can they hold a toothbrush? If they can hold a toothbrush, but they don't necessarily know how to move that toothbrush, could an electronic toothbrush help like cleaning their teeth. If they are learning to floss and they can't handle using the floss, would a water pick work? Mobility and positioning. Everybody should be practicing mobility and positioning. Even the neurotypical individual changes their positions multiple times throughout the time that they're sitting. You've probably seen me shift my weight as I'm talking, right? Individuals with disabilities struggle with positioning. When you look at an individual on the spectrum, sometimes you see them hanging off the edge of their chair, like the back of the chair doesn't exist to them, right? How do we help them find their body in space? With computer access, there's all different ways to access the computer. And we have to find the right tool for the individual. For every one mouse out there, there's a hundred. And for different keyboards, there's different layouts. We're so used to seeing a QWERTY keyboard, but QWERTY is not what was always used. QWERTY keyboards didn't come out until after World War I because the secretary's hammers were getting jammed while they were typing. And those keyboards were ABC keyboards. So they moved us to a QWERTY keyboard to actually slow typers down. Now you would never know because there's people that can type a hundred words per minute. I am not one of them. So when we look at categories again, we can break it down even further. Education, communication, recreation, sensory, and environmental controls. So in the educational world, we're looking at ways to access the environment and access our curriculum. For communication, we're looking at how can we communicate with individuals in verbal communication as well as written communication. Recreation and leisure. Oftentimes this is something that's overlooked, but how do we get our children to participate in recreation? So if an individual has a visual impairment, you can put bells inside a ball, you can have a beeping ball, right? If you have an individual in a wheelchair, how do they play soccer? Maybe we put a box on the front of their wheelchair so that, that as they're moving their wheelchair, the ball just gets pushed in front of them, right? Sensory aids. What are some squishy toys or a sensory room? Environmental controls. How do we control our environment? How do we turn on the radio? How do we turn on the TV? How do we turn on the fan? How do we open and close our shades? Those are all environmental controls that we can look at for assistive technology. We typically don't look at too much environmental controls within the school environment. We usually do those on home assessments. And then you have aids for daily living right? How do you feed yourself? What are some eating utensils? How do you dress yourself? Bathing and toileting. Executive functioning aids. How do I organize myself and organize my home or my school environment so that I can function? Sleeping aids. This could be 
white noise machines. This could be sensory lighting. This could be positioning, special positioning for the bed, right? Fine motor development. My favorite thing are these new sneakers that you can, it's a full flap that you pull forward, but when you put the flap over, it actually looks like regular shoes. So I request a lot of these for my individuals that are living in group homes because they can put them on and off themselves. And that's a level of independence that they should have. So mobility and positioning, right? A lot of times when we talk about assistive technology, everyone jumps to the first one, a wheelchair. That's mobility and positioning. Gate trainers, positioning laid, standards, and alternative seating. I love alternative seating. I am a lefty in a right world. So when I was in school, all the desks were right-handed. <laughs> I was never able, I always had to cross my body to write. So alternative positioning equipment allows an individual to sit in their most comfortable position. This little blue seat here is great for sitting on the floor. It also acts as a bouncer or a rocker. So it gives that sensory input that an individual may need for seating. You've probably seen some of these, the big therapy balls that students could sit on, the discs that they can sit on. I love this little stool. The stool forces you to work on your core. So if you slouch, the chair goes forward a little bit. If you come back up into main, then the chair comes into me. But then I also love this little rocker. It has enough space if the child was to turn around to the other direction that it's got a writing surface so that they can rock back and forth, kind of like on a rocking horse, but it's low to the ground and doesn't make that creaky noise. And they can practice their writing still with having a little movement and getting that sensory input in for vision and hearing. So lighted visual displays. A lot of times when you look at an individual that has cortical visual impairment or is low vision, you will see them having a light box right? And this floods light coming from the surface through the paper or through the objects and it makes the object stand out more. I use one when I'm working at night because I don't like full light coming from overhead, but I like the back light so that I can still write and draw. Magnifiers, handheld magnifiers, electronic magnifiers, magnifiers are just fantastic. And as I've gotten older, I'm really liking magnifiers. Then you have Braille, which is a specific language for people that are visually impaired and blind. And it's an undertaught skill. If we teach more individuals with visual impairment and blindness how to use Braille, we increase their possibility of getting jobs when they're older. Screen readers. So when you're looking at visually impaired and blindness, you typically look at Zoom text or JAWS, those are really robust software for people that are visual impaired and blind. But we have screen readers for individuals that have learning disabilities that allow you to select one word and have it read back to you, select one word and have an a dictionary pop up. And then you just have talking products like this little clock. I love this little clock. I typically recommend it for majority of my students that are learning how to tell time because they can check their work or they can check with the time without asking what time it is. They hit the little green button and it says it's 1010. And then you have a higher end product such as this visual daily schedule, which talks as a time slot comes up, it says it's 1215, it's time for lunch. And there's different ways that you can display the content on that visual schedule. And you can have checkoffs and you can have video samples so that students can see the tasks that they're supposed to be doing. Computer access. This is my favorite, one of my favorite things to do. Looking at ways for children and young adults or anybody actually to have access to the computer. We take for granted that everybody can access a computer the way we do, right? But there's alternative keyboards. There's these huge ones, which are the big keys. They're huge. The buttons are about an inch, an inch and a half. The ones I'm showing here on the screen are all different colors, but you can get them in solid black. You can get them in solid white. You can get them in solid yellow. And these are really used for someone that has dexterity 
like they can't do a small key, but they can access a big key. So I do a lot of volunteering at the nursing homes. Typically I can find these at Walmart or Five Below and I'll buy them and I'll bring them into the nursing home and the seniors then can type um, on the keyboard because now they can actually see the keys and they don't have to worry about being so exact on these little keys, right? Adaptive mice. There is a thousand different ways to adapt a mouse, right? You can use a standard mouse. You can use a joystick. You can, um, the one here, this is a computer mouse that you hit buttons so that you can move up and down the screen. There's touch screens that you can see people using the touch screen to move around the screen. Guided computer interfaces. These are really interesting. And what that is, is that it's a specialized software that locks down majority of the computer and you only give access to specific things. You may give the internet, you may give email, you may give word processing. These are great so that when a person's in that computer interface of doing either Windows or Mac, there's a lot of stuff, right? But computer interfaces say, here's the three things that you can have access to, and it's easier for some individuals to use those. There's a ton of built-in accessibility in the iPad, the Mac, and Windows, and even in Microsoft Word. Sometimes we don't even have to look outside what we already have accessible. And those are universal design tools, right? Everybody has access to them. We didn't have to order anything special. It's right there in front of us. And then we have individuals that need really alternative, right? They can't access the computer with a keyboard. They can access it with a mouse. They need to use little switches to access. So they press one switch and it starts a scan. And then they press, either they press that switch again and it stops the scan, they press the switch again and they move forward, right? It's a slower way to access, but if you have no way to access, a switch is faster than nothing. And then my favorite is working with eye gaze and eyes tracking. I move eye tracking up to along with an adaptive mouse. It's a direct access method versus a not direct access method. And eye tracking has opened up the possibility of independence for so many people. And it's gotten much easier to access and easier to use. This means that a person actually uses their eyes to move around the screen and make selections. And there's pitfalls to it. As I said before, you can't go outside with it unless you're in the shaded area, right? But for a person that can't access the computer any other way, this is a fantastic way to give them access. So in education, we're going to look at that we can adapt books. You saw one before where I put popsicles so that a person could turn a page, right? We can look at accessible books, making those books electronic so that a student can have an iPad and they can turn the pages and have words read to them and things like that, right? I can use adaptive paper. I can have paper that has bumpy lines on it. I can have paper that alternates the colors. I can have paper that has wider space so that the student has more ability to write in it. And then adaptive writing tools. We can have a pencil grip. We can have a weighted pencil. We can have the special little pencil grip here that the pencil's out in front for a student that struggles with handwriting. Writing position aids. So having a slant board. And sometimes the slant board has to be flipped the other way so that the writing is, the hand is dropping further down versus being up, right? Using manipulatives. These are things that are in the educational realm. Some of them we can expand out as the individual needs, right? And one is not better than the other. We just have to find what's right for the child. For communication. Communication can be very simple. It can be a picture symbols. It could be a single message device. It could be a mid tech device. It could be a high tech device. It could be the student using Microsoft Word with a screen reader that when they type, it reads out what they're using. So it really depends on that individual's mode of communication and what works best for them. Sometimes using a static board is a preference to using a, a dedicated device. 
I have some individuals that I work with that much prefer a static board, a static spell board or a static board, because then the engagement's with me one-on-one -on -one, and I'm following the conversation and I, I can't pull my attention away why they're writing their message or something because I have to be engaged. So that's a personal preference. And typically when the person wants that, they'll keep rejecting communication device after communication device and say, this is my mode. And they may still use a dedicated device such as the high-end devices when they're in class or when they're at work, but for more personal conversations, they like that static board. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the barriers. Regardless of how great technology is, there are always barriers to this. When we look at the barriers, we know that technology has to be used on a consistent basis. It needs to be integrated into the daily life and daily schedule. It needs to be part of activities and routines on a regular basis. And the tool has to, has to be interactive with others. So oftentimes when we look at why we're having barriers to the implementation of technology, it becomes about the awareness. The parent or the educators aren't aware of what the tool is supposed to do, what tools are we supposed to be using, how to assess it. And then once we assess it, having people accept that using a screen reader or having books read to you is not cheating, right? And then learning and then the usage. Oftentimes we get stuck in the learning that teachers or therapists don't feel like they have enough skill to implement that tool to get to usage, right? So these are some of the things that I've kind of, I, I kind of put it into the survival mastery impact and innovation because in the survival mode, the teacher is not sure what to do with it. Thinks about ways that it could be used, but they're not sure how to do it. They don't even know where to start. So typically when I do an eval, I tell the team to pick one activity a day until they get comfortable and the student gets comfortable with that activity, then you can't move on to the next stages. Because if they are so stuck in the survival mode, like I know I'm supposed to do this, but I don't know how to do this. I'm gonna to try to make it do it, but I still don't know what I'm doing, right? The only way they're gonna to get to mastery is if they receive training and support. If teachers and parents don't receive support and training on how to implement that device, it's not gonna be implemented or it's gonna be half implemented in a way that nobody's sure if it's working. That teachers and parents need time to practice on the tool. The student needs time to practice before the demands ramp up, right? And we wanna build that confidence in the use of that tool that if they make an error, it's okay. Errors are gonna happen. Mistakes are gonna happen with implementation. That's life. Like life is about, we learn more from errors we've made than things that we're perfect at. So every time we practice, we learn something else. So then when we get to the impact mode, this is where the student's using the tool, right? They're using the tool on a regular basis. The teacher's really comfortable that if there's a problem, they can problem solve it or they have the tools to get help to problem solve it. They've embedded it in the lessons. Like when they're looking at their lessons, they're like, Jeanette's gonna be using Microsoft Word to write her assignments. John is going to use PowerPoint to fill in the blanks of the sentences. Samantha is going to tell us what the answer is so that teachers are looking at it in a whole different way. They're doing that differential instruction and knowing that it's one activity and the staff is modeling. They're modeling how to use technology and then the innovation. This is where the teachers really start developing tutorials. They're offering to show others. They're seeing outside this one student. They're saying, hey, this could work for with all my students. Oftentimes we get stuck in the mastery because teachers don't feel that they have enough training to help the students like move it over to the students. So oftentimes when the eval is completed, this is why I say you have to advocate 
for training and support, not just of the staff and your child, but for yourself. Because if you learn the tool, when that tool comes home for them to do schoolwork, then you have the ability to do that. So some closing thoughts. Remember, the child is the focus. The goal is what you're working towards. Technology is a tool to support and help. Technology can improve learning and positive outcomes. And we need to work as a team to accomplish a goal. Now, with all that, with open communication with your, with your school district and having your team understand the impact that technology can make for your child, it's about gentle conversations. And those are hard. I get they're hard. I'm not known to be gentle a lot of times. <laughs> but if we go and see these conversations with an open thought that we can work together and we can do this, oftentimes the team around you will rally. They'll ask, ask for more input. They take you in and they want to learn just as much about the technology that you see for your child as you do for everyone else. So if you have any questions, I'll be here to answer some questions for you. Thank you for coming.